Hi guys, it's Barry and DR, and I want to welcome you to a special interview with a really close friend of mine, a gentleman named Mo, who I've gotten to know. It's about six years now. About? About six years. Right about. And um, I don't say this fairly lightly, but um, I've bounced around this country a fair bit, but it, in my honest opinion, not feeding an ego, it pales in comparison compared to the actual wisdom that Mo's gained through hands-on experience. You know how I've always said the only way to get wisdom is hands-on experience and when you've been an investor, when you own several buildings, um, when you've been in various businesses, that gives you wisdom and I really want to introduce Mo and thank you for sharing some of this wisdom with our viewers, Mo. Well, thank you for having me and uh, hello everybody. How do you want to get this started? How, I wanna, where do I start? I, I know this this could easily, and maybe if I'm lucky enough, it'll be more than one video. But all kidding aside, uh, how long have you been here? I'm almost at 23 years now. 23 years. July 25th will be 23 years I'm here. And you're also a person that's completely fluent in Spanish, French, and English. Well, I couldn't stress enough to everybody, if you're going to live in the Dominican Republic, please learn your Spanish, even at its most basic level. It's the only way to get the most out of people, the best out of people, and little misunderstanding as possible, which will happen often. Yeah. But language, uh, I believe it's the, the way to get through to everybody, and uh, you must you must learn the language. Now, the fact that I know more languages is circumstantial. I was born in Montreal. Mm -hmm. My parents are Italian. Mm -hmm. They were married in Montreal. So I was trilingual right off so the start. So wait a minute. Day. It's Italian, obviously. Yes. Spanish. Yes. French. Yes. And English. That's right. What am I missing here? Well, uh, besides all the bullshit I say most of the time. No, but I mean language <laughs> numbers. <laughs> uh, four. No, no. I speak four, four languages. Four Fluently, languages. though. Yeah. Four languages. Y yeah. Um... Mo, a little bit about, I know you've had uh, several businesses you've owned. You're currently mm -hmm. uh, uh, doing a lot in terms of real estate and, and, and residualized income, but tell us a little bit about some of the businesses that you did have. Well, when I uh, first came here, of course, tourism was everybody's interest as far as investment is concerned, and uh, we were building uh, some uh, night nightclubs, restaurants, and of course condominiums, but we stood away from the condominiums because people were more outgoing and at the time when I arrived here, everybody was talking about the nightlife and the dancing and the cultural side of it, so condominiums was not in the picture. I was here for tourism. Tourism means hotels, not condominiums, so I sort of brushed away from that. And I wish I didn't because it would have been a great uh, venue for me. But uh, the businesses I got involved in really started in Rio San Juan, which was just kicking off in the touristic side because we are surrounded by a couple of beautiful beaches and that attracts people, even the ones who don't live in the area as far as tourism is concerned. But uh, we had a great... Uh, uh, let's just say we had a great run at the time in the late 1990s till about 2002. We had a lot of visitors. Uh, a couple of big hotels were built. Brand new golf course, you know. So that helped a lot. You mm -hmm. know? And of course, like everything else, you know, uh, things started like sort of getting a little shaky on the touristic side. Business, you know, politics, people investing in other parts in the island. So the attention was sort of drawn away from the north coast a lot of businesses were doing bad as far as the hotel and bed and breakfast a lot of struggling because the south and the, the east end with punta cana and bavaro was sort of taking most of the, the limelight away from us about what years are we talking about here mo oh this now we're talking uh, roughly circa 2003 2004 but uh, Cabrera, that didn't stop Cabrera from growing. We've had our own uh, small group of serious investors who got involved with uh, residential homes, villas, private villas, rental villas. Is that the right term? Rental villas. And uh, that sort of helped put Cabrera on the map. And also Rio San Juan. But because I live in Cabrera primarily, I see a lot more action here. 
you know, and uh, so uh, basically now that things are starting to sort of turn around, uh, we're starting to get more attention over here. There's more construction going on. Uh, the local people are building second floors to their homes. Uh, there's been uh, some beautification to the city or the town, and uh, I can't complain. I'm happy to be here, although I've had my ups and downs, but I'm I very... Think that's life, though. Yeah, I am very happy to be here. I think this is the right moment for people like who are planning on moving to this particular area. I think it's a good time to be here because you, you've got a bigger specter of what investments are all about. It's not just coming here and doing a little two-bedroom house and spending four or five months into the sun. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to Cabrera than just that standard uh, mentality as far as getting away, getting a home away from home, excuse me. Let me ask you something else though. You were also in the cigar exporting business. Yes. I, I, I love the one you, we, over a few beers he was telling me a, <laughs> a story about uh, down at the airport with uh, export taxes. But oh, anyway, good Lord. you want to share that? You mind sharing? Yeah, that was great. Sure, sure. That was awesome. I, um, <laughs> the guy says his dictionary. It's <laughs> hilarious. But We had, uh, we had uh, some customers in uh, Quebec, that's the province where I come from, who were interested in always, of course, Cuban cigars. So when we first arrived here, my brother and I, who was my partner at the time, he's a cigar aficionado, and we were going around mainly the Santiago area, where the valleys are, where they were growing uh, certain leaves. I'm not familiar with the terms anymore. And we did a tour with the Leon Jimenez company, okay. the first company that I met that were doing machine rolled cigars, you know. So we started venturing around, and we, we met a lot of people who were making their own cigars, these big barns and people just going away at it, and they were happy to have us there. So uh, we decided, okay, we're going to start bringing some of this stuff back home. Now, because I'm not a, an expert on cigars, I found that the Dominican tobacco, and I'm talking now 1997, 98, 99, okay? Way back, yeah. yeah. Uh, was sweeter than the Cuban tobacco. Now, I'm not going to attack companies or... I said, why is Cuban cigar so much more popular than, you know, than the Dominican cigar? I found it sweeter, lighter. And at the time, we had, we had just built our bed and breakfast, so we stocked up on all kinds of cognacs and champagnes and whatever. We were even serving chocolate and strawberries when they were available to accompany the cigars because sure. that was the absolutely you know okay so now going to you know and the later years after we did it for about four years now of course nobody knew how to fill up the forms at customs <laughs> so i had to go to santo domingo setopex it's called i don't know if it still exists and they gave us all the information gladly i sat down two hours with the secretary and this other individual, which I don't remember their names anymore, and they showed us the forms, they explained us thoroughly. It wasn't difficult at all. But back then, it had to be typed by a machine. So you try to find the typewriter <laughs> in Cabrera. So there was a lawyer in town who had one, so every two, three weeks, I would go see him and I'd have to type in the forms because it had to be done by typewriter back then. So now we go to Puerto Plata Airport, which was the airport of our area at the time. And I'm here with the supervisor, <laughs> and he's looking at the forms, and nobody knows what the hell's going on here, you know. So I explained to him, I go, listen, this is the number of our representative at Setopex. I call them. This is the way we have to fill up the forms to send it. And then my partner in Canada has similar forms, which he has to fill up there to receive the merchandise. It took about half an hour and everything went smoothly. The box was stamped, taped, and sent. I get a phone call <laughs> from Canada and they say, listen Mo, uh, we got the box over here, but nobody knows what to do with it. This is Mirabel Airport in Montreal. Mm. <laughs> so I said, well, uh, who's the man in charge? Uh, he goes, well, so-and-so is here, but they've never seen these things before. I said, well, it's their cigars. Open the box. So they opened up the box. They looked at the forms, and they let it pass. Okay. Back then, of course, even today, there was the Havana House. They control the 
I guess the taxation, oh, okay. the control, everything, everything. So we had a humongous humidor built in our house, and uh, we had about 400 boxes in that humidor, and everything was going smooth. Like you know, you could now, imagine. Wait, wait, 400 boxes. Boxes of 25. And 25. That's 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 a hefty amount of dollars. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just so you guys know okay. what he's talking. Now remember, about. I have all the bills. Everything is registered. Our company is registered. This not. This is all on the up and up. After we established near, after by the third year that we've been doing business, and you could only do business four months of the year. Comes winter time, no one's smoking indoors. The golf courses are all closed, right? Okay, that was so a big now market. Okay. We stored our boxes, everything perfectly, but we kept filling up these forms the way they had explained us to, and there was always somebody there. We had to personally fill them up ourselves because nobody ever understood these forms, and they were in all languages. One day, we get a surprise visit by the SWAT team <laughs> at, my, at my brother's house where we had the humidor. And guys come in with machine guns and masks. And my partner just went white like a ghost. <laughs> goes, what's going on? He goes, we're confiscating everything. I goes, why? He goes, well, we're looking at your bills and we cannot believe that you paid 15 pesos for one cigar. And I said, well, those are the bills. They're stamped. That's the price. We paid the exportation tax. We paid everything. We're doing this legitimately. No, 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 no. We have orders from the Havana house that we have to confiscate everything. And then, you know, we were in court for two years after that. We won the case, but we lost all the cigars. So you could imagine what happened. And that was it. I stopped that business. You and know. then you... you then from there you started from the ground up <laughs> the bakery oh yeah well that was my uh, second <laughs> phase after the bed and breakfast we put it up for sale I got into back into the old business the family business which was bakery deli but I just had a small bakery here and it was doing well for a while but unfortunately when you're dealing with artisanal products in a town that is not familiar with them uh, you cannot last outside the, the high season mm. which is roughly late november to early march okay so you you were relying on the foreigners absolutely because the, we i was making european style breads the way i was taught by my father the way i had made them for 15 years in montreal for the duration of the time that i worked with my father so basically i had uh, all the foreigners of cabrera coming to me but comes march April, they're all going back to their country, and my numbers went down by at least 50%, and by the time August came around, it was really, you know, a ghost town for that business at the time, and eventually I had to close it, and then I went to the real estate, I mean, I started renting. That's what got you? Got me into my apartments, renting apartments, and okay. furnished apartments, of course, for people who are speculating or investors, people who are not sure if they want to live here but don't want to buy furniture, they're here for six months, maybe a year, mm -hmm. and they don't want to go too far out of their way of investing too much money and getting stuck, you know, with furniture, especially furniture and electro domestic stuff and all that. I got to give them a plug. I'm not supposed to, but one of the few landlords uh, that I know of in the Caribbean, and you know, guys, that's what I do for a living. One of the few landlords that uh, any kind of problem you have, it's just 1-800-MO, and it's kind of fixed instantly. He understands that, which is a, I would say, either a capitalist or first world understanding of business, but that is reassuring to your tenants. It's because I was brought up that way. When you deal with customers, people spend money for your product, they deserve all the attention in the world. you got to pamper them. Yeah. For a lack of a better word. You do have to pamper your customers. Uh, I've been in the food business before I ever got into the rental business. So you could imagine how delicate it is. You're feeding people. I never had one complaint in my lifetime. I thank my father and thank God for that. Uh, we were always very careful and clean. And uh, I maintained that attitude. And it's good for long-term business and return business. What about, though, you started in Cabrera, your rentals, or you started, because you expanded, now you're in the capital, you got buildings? and uh, In the capital, uh, it was ma mainly family. Uh, we uh, bought some apartments for relatives. Uh, they came for a while. We ended up 
buying them all back ourselves. Okay. Because my brother and I are here. We're here full time, and uh, my are you wife. Renting them now? Uh, no, right now what we used to rent, we sold. We, I see. We just kept what we need to stay in Santo Domingo when we're dealing with documents. Okay. Or certain personal affairs. Uh, my wife, who's Dominican, my wife of 21 years, is from Santo Domingo. Okay. So she had, when I met her, she already built her house, and uh, I helped her finish it. And uh, she's got a big family, so like we always help each other out. But as far as renting, it, it got difficult because the staff that was helping us, when you're not there, you know how it is. Uh, sure. The mouse always dances when the cat's away type sure, of thing, sure, you know. Sure. So it got a little difficult. And uh, but the, the, I can't complain. The, the numbers were good. A lot of foreigners visit short term. It could be anything from four days to ten days. Mm -hmm. And Santo Domingo is the place everybody goes. I mean, let's face it. Uh, if you want to have your share of junk food while you're here, you got to be in the Santo Domingo yeah. and the big cities. Yeah, here you it's know? more of a natural. Diet. Yeah, here we're natural. We're healthier. We're happier <laughs> <laughs> most times yeah most of the times but we are happier I uh, I'm not kidding for anyone who's gonna be watching this segment if you ever do come here uh, I hope you look me up because I would like to help Barry and welcome you.